Thank you. I'm a little bit jet lagged, but fortunately, my lovely sister-in-law and husband have been treating me really well since yesterday. We've eaten a lot, which is really what I do a lot in Utica. I tend to eat a lot. Um, just to give you a very brief background, actually, I do want to thank Baca and the Historical Society. Um, it really is an honor to be here. This is the first of a few events I'm going to be doing this coming week around the book. Um, but I've been coming to Utica over 48 years. Uh, my wife and I went to uh, Oswego and that's where we met. And then we moved to Albany and went to graduate school there. Utica's like a second home. So I saw in an article a couple days ago, local author shares story about Bosnian genocide. I said, well, I've finally been accepted. As a native son of Utica, I feel good about that. So um, in any event, so I want to also acknowledge that uh, for the last week, we have all been witnessing uh, the horrors in Ukraine. Uh, I also, I have many, I have, over the last few years, I have many friends and allies who are Bosnian, and this has been a very tough time. And really anyone who's experienced war, the trauma of war, the trauma of war, to be seeing this on the news is not easy. So um, I will forewarn you, I'm going to be, you know, the discussion may also, or my presentation and discussion it might be a little bit difficult. Um, there's a video I'm going to show later, and I'll definitely give you forewarning if you, and, and you'll see, if you want to close your eyes or, or, or uncomfortable, want to go outside, but I'll let you know but really just to acknowledge that this is a tough time for all of us, and I think particularly for those who've, who've uh, survived the trauma of war. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, appreciate it. So the, as you can see in the, uh, the title of this presentation, The Horrors of Genocide in Bosnia, Universal Lessons in Rhetoric, Rage, and Resilience. And one of the things that I ask you to do is sort of universalized. Now clearly my, my interest in, in a cause and my mission in a way has been, as Sandro had said, to give voice to truth as uh, to what happened in Bosnia. And we can talk more about why that's so important and why that's being uh, stunted, particularly in the Balkans by, by people who are still nationalist and won't acknowledge and deny the genocide. But I think if we look around the world, and even here in our own country, our own country, we want to be vigilant um, about where we're headed as human beings. And so that's why I titled this as Universal Lessons. So just kind of pay attention to that as we go forward. And we will go forward. Maybe we won't go forward. Which is that? I was hitting that. Okay. I'll have Patrick come up here every time we <laughs> move the slide. In any event, so BIH is another way of saying Bosnia and Herzegovina. And as you can see, this is the map of, and just for, for brevity's sake, I'll say of Bosnia. And if you look at the top, sort of the north, just below Croatia, you're going to see, if you can, it says Republika Srpska. And then as you kind of circle around, you'll see also Republika Srpska. Keep in mind, for those of you who are not familiar with that term, uh, that comes into play later in my presentation, and we'll talk more about that. But essentially, there are, essentially, there's Republika Srpska, which is an entity within Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, and since Bosnia is very ethnic, ethnically divided, Republika Srpska is primarily uh, Serb, and the rest of the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina um, Bosniak, which is Bosnian Muslim, and uh, Croat. And then there are people who are, at this point, in the so-called democracy of Bosnia, there are people who are Roma, Jewish, or don't identify, who are not actually considered full-fledged citizens in Bosnia. But at this point, for the purposes of the presentation, we're going to look at primarily those three ethnic groups, Bosniak, um, uh, Serb, and Croat. Okay, so anybody recognize this man? You might. Slobodan Milosevic, who was one of the architects 
of the genocide and the war in Bosnia, which took place from 1992 to 1995. And um, later you'll learn why, I mean, it was, certainly was a war. Eventually uh, there was a Bosnian army. We'll talk a little more about that later and how it developed into a war. But at this point, Serb nationalism in what was then called Yugoslavia, okay, um, becomes dominant. And in 1989, and this is a picture from 89, Milosevic gives a speech in, in what's called Gazimestan, which uh, held the monument for what was called, what for was the Battle of Kosovo in 1389. And he's given a speech here to approximately a million ethnic Serbs in Kosovo, another area in, in the Balkans. Um, so this was uh, a commemoration of, of an event that happened 600 years before. But it's incredibly important as part of this mythological, this legend on the part of nationalist Serbs. It played into, believe it or not, well, many of you know and, and probably do believe it because you experienced it, but it played into sort of the whole notion of, of this greater Serbia, which is it's essential what Milosevic and the other nationalist Serbs were looking to do in, in their invasion in the early 1990s. Okay, so Milosevic, who was the president of Serbia, okay, Yugoslavia is starting to fall apart and break apart, and um, you know, Milosevic, uh, at, at this point, and nationalism is a way of um, really whipping up hate, ultimately. And that's what he's doing. He's saying in this speech that in the, um, basically, we want this, this greater Serbia, and we will be victorious. We'll right any wrongs that have happened to us, including in the Battle of, uh, Kos uh, Battle of Kosovo, and creates this us versus them scenario. And we know, as we see in our own lives and we see in this country and wherever, um, that tends to be how, you know, nationalism works. Okay. So in that, and, and this is really just a brief background, um, you know, what, what we're going to do tonight, but there were referendums. Yugoslavia had six republics and there were referendums from each republic to become their own separate nation. Okay, so Croatia did so in 1991, as did Slovenia, and um, the, the JNA, which is a Yugoslav People's Army, uh, was sent essentially by Milosevic into Slovenia to try to convince them, to defeat them, so that they would not, uh, in a sense, secede from Yugoslavia, even though they had voted, the people had voted for independence. Uh, that war, if it was, lasted 10 days. It doesn't seem that that was strategically important for Milosevic. So the army withdrew. But in Croatia, uh, it was a much, Milosevic saw this as a much bigger problem. And the war lasted for, um, I think, somewhat, uh, somewhere about, about three years. There are other, and I see my friend Hiro here, but there, at one point, Croatia aligned with Serbia. I'm not going to get into those details, but eventually they were no longer aligned. So that war between Serbia and Croatia um, continued. And I, and I mentioned Hiro because he, he was someone who was in, in, in the fighting and at one point was fighting on both fronts. He's a brave man. He really is a good man. So now at the time, the JNA, the Yugoslav People's Army, okay, they're providing arms to a, a Bosnian Serb army that is developing. And um, many of the people, and, and those of you here who have, and I've spoken with some, there wasn't a great realization that the mobilization of this army, this Bosnian Serb army, was taking place. Because you have to, you know, we look at neighbors, regardless of ethnicity and religion, for the most part, were friends, or at least very neighborly. I've talked to people who said, you know, I. I my, you know, my, my godfather, you know, maybe that person Bajniak, my godfather was Orthodox Serb Christian. It didn't matter. It didn't matter. Um, but it turned out to the, the ultranationalists, it did. Okay, so we go back to the Battle of Kosovo. And um, this is a battle where the Ottoman Empire was expanding. 
okay, and the Ottoman Empire was expanding uh, Islam into Europe and into Kosovo, and the Serbian kingdom uh, tried to stop it. There was a, a battle of Kosovo, and, and the Ottomans won. Um, and this, the, the leader, the military leader of the, um, uh, the Serbs was a guy named Prince Lazar, who I believe, and maybe some of you know better, I believe he was captured and beheaded, but the Orthodox Christian Church soon thereafter, again, this is 1389, decided that he's a martyr and that he was sacrificed to be in heaven, to be a bulwark of Christianity uh, in heaven, okay? So this became very important, and when uh, Milosevic is making his speech, at times he was called a little Lazar because he was seen as willing to sacrifice for the good of Orthodox Serb Christianity. Um, but this is sort of symbolic. There are other things in the history of, of Serbs, particularly nationalistic Serbs, that is symbolic of uh, what motivates them to want this, again, greater Serbia, which does not include anyone really but Serbs. Now, it, and, and even today, and we'll talk a little bit about what's going on, there's a crisis going on today in Bosnia, but that same, uh, you know, that same desire uh, is, is there, and the Battle of Kosovo is part of the legend that motivates the victimization, really, and the desire to, to create this, this, this Serbia, Great Serbia. Um, just a really brief overview of World War II, and it was really a horrific time for a lot of people. Um, Croatia in the 20s started, uh, there was a movement called the Ustasha in the 1920s. It was a political movement, but the Ustasha in the, uh, during World War II aligned with the uh, Nazis and, and the towns with, with the Axis powers. Um, and uh, they were quite brutal. I mean, quite brutal. Uh, and so they had, um, they committed genocide uh, you know, horrific, uh, genocide is horrific. They committed genocide because they were looking to create a purely Croatian state, okay? And they had these truly brutal death squads, if you're interested in that, and I know certainly people might be, uh, uh, you know, interested in the history, look up Ustasha, and uh, it's hard to read because of the things that they did to others, and they set up one uh, many uh, concentration camps, but one called Yasenovac, which was a notorious camp. And you could see not just in the camp, but overall they murdered between 300,000 and 600,000 ethnic Serbs. So again, as part of, I mean, it's horrific stuff, but as part of the sort of the victimization, that's another reason that Milosevic and others, we'll get into talking about some of the others, um, look to have their own, their own nation because of this. Okay. The, uh, and as you can see in terms of statistics, 30,000 Jews were murdered by the Ustasha, 29,000 Roma uh, in Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. The Serbs had this a royalist force, I guess, but called Chetniks. And Chetniks also aligned with the Axis. Um, but their, their, their focus um, was against primarily against the partisans, which were communists led, led by Tito, and we'll talk just a bit about him you know, in a moment. Um, but in the meantime, their ethnic cleansing, which by the way, I'll, I have a slide later, we'll talk about it. I um, really don't like that term because it's so sterile and it, it's, it's not right, it's genocide. In any event, their, what, what the Chetniks did was target uh, Bosniaks and, and uh, Croats in Bosnia and Croatia towards, again, this goal of, of Greater Serbia, and it is said that they murdered up to 68,000. Now, the term Chetnik also, from World War II, came into play in uh, the 19, 1992. They were referred to as Chetniks, and the Chetniks, very brutal. Those of you who were involved, and those of you who have read about, it, and those of you who are interested, the Chetniks, um, horrible people, for sure. Okay, just a bit about communist Yugoslavia. So there were six republics, including Bosnia, and Josip Broz Tito, who led the partisans uh, to victory and became communist Yugoslavia in 1945, he, he ruled essentially until he died in 1980. 
And the, the Yugoslavia moved from communism or to socialism. Um, you know, I have heard from many people when, when if you talk to somebody perhaps old enough who says, I yearn for the, the good old days before the war, what they're talking about typically is Yugoslavia because um, people were, they, they were, people were um, much more aligned and uh, Tito, though he's brutal to his enemies, but Yugoslavia allowed, for example, for um, people to get three-month visas and go to other countries to earn money and, and bring it back or send it back to their families. Most communist countries did not do that. Um, but Tito allowed it, and like I said, people got, got along. Um, they were ethnically mixed. 18% of marriages in Yugoslavia were of mixed ethnicity, and, and I mentioned Hiro again. His wife, Merci, had told me, and I'm going to give a plug, Yummy Licious Cafe, because it's a good place, but, but she learned how to bake bread from a Jewish woman across the street, and it was just a much you know, more connected community. So, however, after Tito died, um, you know, people are sort of, you know, looking, looking to, uh, to fill that void, and the economy is sliding, inflation's high, and then you have the likes of Milosevic and others who are, um, you know, whipping, you know, whip, whipping people into frenzy, you know, in, in this nationalist fervor, saying, you know, they're the one, you know, and you know how it always is, right? They're the ones, whoever the they is, that's the other. They're the ones causing our problems. So we need to stay together and eliminate them. And that's kind of how, it's a very simplistic view, but that's kind of how the playbook of, of nationalism eventually goes. So I mentioned there's peaceful coexistence, that's the norm. And then the republics gained independence in the early 90s. I mentioned that Croatia and Slovenia in 1991, their, their uh, citizens vote for independence, and uh, Bosnia does as well. In fact, yesterday was Bosnia Independence Day. But now we see that um, particularly Serb ethno-nationalism is on the rise. And you, you, know, you noted the speech in 1989. It didn't stop with that. Um, it, you know, it, it, it got worse. Let me tell you that the demographics, right now I think, that, I don't know if there are 2.5 million people in Bosnia or maybe a little more. It's a small country, but at the time in 1991, there were 4.4 uh, million people. And you notice on the census, by the way, Bosniaks, I don't know if this is the European way of spelling it, I spell it with a K, but Bosniaks are 43% of citizens were Bosniak, and you can see 31% Serb, 17% Croat, 9% other. It's that other category, again, which has made Bosnia not the democratic place because uh, at this point, because the others are not allowed even to run for office. Again, another issue. But right now, we're just looking at demographics. So the majority of Bosnia uh, were Bosniaks. Okay, this is in 1991. The beginning of the Bosnian-Serb invasion. You can see this picture, and those of you who are looking and know uh, Mladic, General Ratko Mladic, he's in the sort of middle, a little over to which would that be, to the uh, left, okay. Um, he led the Bosnian Serb army and the invasion. And so Bosnia declares through vote uh, its independence. It's recognized by the U.S. It's in Mar March 1st, basically 1992. Milosevic and Radovan Karadic, who uh, is, was the, the political leader of the Bosnian Serbs, um, by the way, well, we'll get to that in a second. Then Ratko Mladic, the general, they lead the ethnic cleansing campaign. I put it in quotes. I think it was Milosevic who even termed, came up with the term. It may have been earlier, but ethnic cleansing. But in any event, um, Karadic was the political leader, and he primarily and Mladic were the, with Milosevic, of course, were the architects of a uh, genocide against, you know, calling for the elimination of of uh, Bosniaks, primarily in, in Catholic Croats, to create their own, you know, nation state. Um, but that's Radic, Mladic. Mladic and Karadic currently are uh, spending life in prison for the crime of genocide. Okay. On April 7th, the Bosnian Serb army begins shelling Sarajevo. It begins what's called the Siege of Sarajevo, which lasted for about three and a half years. Uh, and they evade towns in eastern Bosnia, uh, large, uh, with large Bosniak populations. Okay. 
Now, my book, um, And Still We Rise, begins in Priador. Priador is in northwest Bosnia, as you can see, and Priador is both a municipality, which is like a county here in this country, but it was also the largest city in the municipality of Priador. And in my book, these three, Omarska, Keraterm, and Ternopolye, were three concentration camps in the Priador region. Um, Omarska, you can see the picture here. That is a picture of Omarska. It was a iron ore mining company. Uh, I don't think it was functioning right before the war, but the Bosnian Serbs used it as a concentration camp. And, and within it is a large hangar, and then there are various offices and storage rooms, which is where the prisoners were kept. The building in front, as you can see, it's called, it was known as the White House. And the White House, uh, many people who went into the White House, which at the time when, when this was an iron ore mining company, were, you know, were offices and probably where truck drivers checked in before they took their trucks into the hangar in the big building. But it became a, a significant place of torture. And many who went into the White House did not return. Keraterm was a ceramics factory on the outskirts of the city of Priador. It too was turned into a notorious uh, concentration camp. And then Ternopoli is actually the name of a village in the Priador municipality, um, but the primary school in Ternopoli was turned into a concentration camp as well. And again, um, as, as you know, and we all know what concentration camps involve, and you could see it up there, but one of the things that, well, we'll get into it later, actually. But the mass graves, um, there are still many who, who the, the Serbs, after murdering um, uh, many, would put them in mass graves to conceal their crimes and even remove them from those mass graves to, to put in, into other graves. And there are still, um, I think, roughly 1,000 or maybe 1,700 um, uh, victims who have not been identified, but that was part of, this is all part of the, you know, the genocide that happened. Okay, so I'm just throwing this out there. This is a system of the identified concentration camps in Bosnia, and you can see them, and if you look up through the northwest, you see Priador and how many there were, but there are others that probably weren't even identified. Um, I, I've spoken with, uh, in fact, she's in She'll be in the next book that I'm working on. And she's from a place called Bozanski Novi. And her uncle um, was, um, and her father were in a hotel in Bozanski Novi that was a concentration camp. And they were also, and she had a cousin who was in a fire station that was used as a concentration camp. So I don't, I, I think there are many more than what's identified here. Now, the term genocide was you know, adopted by the United Nations in 1948. Uh, in the Convention on Genocide, as you can see here, whereby its definition includes various harmful acts with committed intent to destroy in whole or part a national, ethnic, religious group as such. And one of the things, that one of the talks I gave a few months ago, someone tried to actually challenge me, which is fine, I love questions, but um, said, how could you call what happened in Bosnia. How do you even compare it to the Holocaust? And I said, well, I would never compare it to the Holocaust. I don't think we can, but the intent was there. The intent to eliminate or erase an ethnicity, a culture, a group of people was there. So it, it in, for me, it was, Dean and I have talked about it, it's not a war. It was, I mean, it became a war, but it was genocide on the part, the intent was genocide on the part of the ethnic Serbs, and I, and I elaborate on that a bit more here. You can see sitting in the picture are refugees looking to uh, get out of, of Bosnia back in, I don't know what year, but in the early 90s. But you could see that uh, 25 to 35,000 Bosniak civilians were killed during the war. And you can see, you could read the statistics, and I said mostly Bosniaks have, uh, 7,000 mostly Bosniaks are still missing. I, it, it may be less than that, but, and you can see also how many um, Bosnian Croats and Bosnian Serbs were killed. Uh, Bosnian men and boys were particularly tar targeted for murder um, because they were seen as potentially fighters that could fight against, and, and, and many were, but they were particularly targeted. Um, and well, I'll get into the Srebrenica genocide in a second. 
um, but you can see how many women and girls were raped. That was a tool of war, um, horrific stuff, but this was part of the genocide, not ethnic cleansing, this was part of the genocide that was perpetrated by, by Bosnian Serbs. And then over a thousand religious sites were destroyed and hundreds of thousands of people displaced. Currently there are roughly two million Bosniaks living in the Balkans and a million um, Bo uh, Bosniaks living elsewhere. And I, I don't know, what, how many in Utica? Seven, eight, ten thousand? Six thousand? Six thousand, okay. And then nationwide there are three, uh, approximately three hundred thousand um, uh, people who came from Bosnia, who, who live here in the diaspora now in, in, in America. Okay, so then we had the Dayton Peace Accords. Um, this was, uh, it, it was uh, brokered by the United States to stop the war. And it did stop the war. So, so after, you know, from April 7th, approximately 1992, well, not approximately, 1992, to December 14th, 1995, the war is ended. These, these peace accords aside, uh, I'm sorry, assigned, but the Bosnian Serbs are given this Republika Srpska. And remember before I showed you on the map, Republika Srpska. It's an entity within Bosnia. 49% of the land of Bosnia is Republika Srpska. 51% is the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. But in a sense, it rewarded the genocide heirs for what they did. Stop the war, but it is um, politically... Uh, and this is where the, sort of the heart of the denial of the genocide comes from Republika Srpska. And you can imagine too, and I'll, I mean, maybe I'm skipping another slide, but you can imagine if you're a survivor and you've had a survivor of the genocide, but you've had a great deal of loss and you wanted to, and, and you've returned to, let's say, Priador, which is part of Republika Srpska, and you're sitting in a cafe and you see the guard who was at the concentration camp who um, you know, beat and tortured your brother, you could see how, how damaging that would be. But most of the people living in Republika Srpska are Orthodox Christian Serb. And um, this was not a good setup. And, and we see today there, there are, there's major political problem, and I'll get into that in a second, uh, because of the establishment of the entity of Republika Srpska. So it also, Dayton also established this um, office of the high representative, and that is where there is a high representative who, who oversees Dayton to make sure that it's being followed, um, you know, as had been written. Okay. But it also set up this unmanageable tripartite central government. So you have trip, three presidents, one from Republika Srpska, okay, and the guy now, Milorad Dodik, we'll talk about him. He's, he's a genocide denier. He wants to secede, have Republika Srpska secede. Uh, they have already established their own military police force. He wants to withdraw from the judicial system of the overall, of, the, of, of Bosnia overall. But you have three presidents, right? A, a Croat, you have Dodik, from Republika Srpska, and then you have the uh, Federation, Bosniaks represented. So it's become an ethnically divided government. In addition, we can get to that too, but the corruption is off the charts. So there's a lot of reform needed. Sandra had mentioned that I'm, um, I'm involved in the working group for Bosnia and Herzegovina, and that's one of the things. We have a lot of, there are a lot of people in this, this organization, and we're really advocating for a true democracy for all citizens in Bosnia. It is not happening that, that way now, and there is a great deal of corruption. And the, the economy is not good. There's a, there are a lot of younger people particularly leaving Bosnia because Dayton. Dayton was not the best approach. It did stop the war. It's created numerous problems since. Okay, and I said the region's very divided. Okay, so just again to note, this is, if you, if you look, the pink is Republika Srpska and the blue is the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So you can sort of visualize how it's, how it's divided in terms of land, but it's divided uh, ethnically and politically as well. And then there was the ICTY, which were the, the criminal trials, and I mentioned before, Mladic and Karadic, and they were convicted of the crime of genocide, so their life imprisonment, but um, 
this was very exacting. Uh, you know, there was there were millions really of pages of documentation uh, for these trials, and it is the first tribunal set up since Nuremberg and since the Tokyo tribunals to um, to to try the the architects and others of the genocide. And you can see, in all that time, 62 Serbs were convicted. Uh, most of uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, some, very few, of the crime of genocide. 29 Croats, 5 Bosniaks were convicted. And there's still, as I mentioned before, many war criminals at Rome free uh, that people will see on the streets. And it's obviously very disconcerting. Now, the only crime deemed a genocide was that in Srebrenica, where um, if you haven't seen, whoops, if you haven't seen Quo Vada Saida, uh, it's an incredible movie, it's, it's heavy, but it's very well done and depicts the, the genocide in Srebrenica, uh, you know, quite well. Um, the, the target of, the, of that genocide, uh, and, and the, there were murders of 8,372 men and boys. There were women and girls killed as well. Um, but it was the only crime seen as gen genocide by the IC2I. Now, I've done a lot of reading about the concentration camps, what happened in Priador and little cities like Kozarats. In Priador, uh, there's Visegrad and Foca and many other places where, you know, and, and, and I'm not alone in this and I am not an expert, but to me, they were also clearly should have been considered places where genocide occurred. Okay, I talked about denial and revision, well, I will, revisionism and glorification. So it's heavily embedded even to RS's Republika Srpska and in Serbia, um, even to where there are competing education systems. So if you see a textbook, a history book in the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's gonna talk about the genocide and, and the war. But you see textbooks, this is how kids are being brought up in Republika Srpska, that there, this is glorification, that Milotic, for example, is a uh, war hero, and that the, that the genocide never happened. And so you can see this is going on in the same country. Now, uh, if you, the picture is of um, a uh, Muslim cemetery in Priador that a few months ago, um, someone scr uh, scratched graffiti outside the cemetery, and that is Milotic. So if nothing, well, it's not, I won't say if nothing else, but it's psychologically quite intimidating for those who, wished, who had wished to return to their home in Priador, who were Bosniak, uh, and there's a whole, there's, 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 it's very complicated how returnees even got their homes back. Um, but in any event, so people who are living there who are Bosniak, uh, and they're, they're experiencing this type of thing. There's a, a big, you know, there's a, a billboard of Mladic going into what was his, you know, his hometown in Republika Srpska. Um, so it's, it's, uh, not an easy place to be. Um, recently, and I mentioned the Office of High Representative, before the recent uh, uh, Representative Insko, before he left after being for, there for 12 years, he, he uh, imposed a law that criminalized genocide denial. But it's not really working because uh, this man, Dodik, Milorad Dodik, you're supposed to boo when I say his name, but in any event, um, his inflammatory rhetoric is really, in some sense, no different from what you saw out of Milosevic or Karadzic or Mladic or any of the others. Uh, he has been pushing for secession, meaning removing Republika Srpska from the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is not, it, it's, it's, Dayton would never, you know, the Dayton Accords would not allow that, but he's, he has been pushing the envelope, talking about secession, leaving, and he, he espouses regularly genocide denial, and he's just wanting the law to come down on him. Uh, and, and it's not at this point, and there are a number of reasons why. Um, but um, one of the things that needs to happen is a memorialization. Now we have here, for example, Holocaust uh, museums in Srebrenica, which is in Priador, there, and I have not been there, I'm hoping to go this, this summer, but there is a wonderful, um, it's called the Srebrenica Memorial Center, and it is like a Holocaust museum. And it is also where every July, when, uh, and maybe people here have experienced that, July 11th, um, because that is when 
Mladic and the Bosnian Serbs marched into, into Srebrenica and began their murderous rampage. Uh, it's uh, at the Memorial Center in a place called Potichari, um every July 11th or so, uh, when remains are discovered, even partial remains are found of, of lost loved ones, there is a burial and ceremony at the Memorial Center. But there are not, there's not memorialization, for example, in Priador, in Kozarets, there's a very small little, sta um, there's some sort of, uh, you know, commemorative, um, I don't know, not a statue, but something like that, a wall. But most places, I mean, there are, there are numerous atrocities, and because they're in Republika Srpska, there's no memorialization, no commemoration. And I'll give you an example. In Priador, every August 6th, at Omarska, and my friend who wrote the foreword for the book, who I met in the process, his name is Satko Mujajic, and he lives in Brussels, and he shared a lot about the two concentration camps he was in, which went into the characters of my, my new book. Um, Satko has told me they go back every August 6th because that's when the, the camp officially closed. It did last for a couple more weeks, but officially closed because it was discovered by uh, reporters that the Serbs had these horrific concentration camps, so the world didn't like it, and, and, and the camps closed. Um, so they go back every August 6th for commemoration, and there are a number of people there, and they release white balloons to commemorate those who were lost, and there's a little plaque that gets put up in the White House to commemorate, and now um, Omar Ska is run by the largest steel manufacturer in the world, in London, uh, ArcelorMittal. They actually, I don't know how they do it, but they, it has become, you know, they, it, they're a major steel manufacturer, and so they still use now this iron ore factory, and, and they don't want to make political waves, so Arcelor says, you can come for the four hours, and once you leave, we pull the plaque down, we'll see you again next August 6th. So there's, there's no, you know, the commemoration is limited, but it is needed. Education, obviously, is needed, and that's the purpose of museums and, and commemoration. Um, I have befriended a man named Dr. David Pettigrew, who is really an incredible guy. He teaches at Southern Connecticut State University. He's a strong advocate for the rights, human rights in Bosnia, and he, um, uh, he's part of the working group, and he, he does a lot, he does a lot of interviews in Bosnia, on Bosnian TV and newspapers, and, and he said the survivors of the genocide have kept their hearts open uh, to the hope that the truth will lead to justice. The question is finally whether the international community will honor that hope, because it's, it's again, I said there's a major political crisis the West has not, um, has not really Maybe now with what's going on in Ukraine, the West has not really come to support uh, Bosnia as it should have. So I see my book, by the way, as uh, doing my part in giving voice to truth, as was mentioned earlier, and we'll talk a little bit more about the book uh, later on. Um, but what I wanted to do is, and this is where I'm going to ask, oh, hopefully it's not going on just yet. Okay. You may want to close your eyes and listen to the song. Have any of you seen the documentary or know Miss Sarajevo? Okay, well, actually I want to read this because, okay, the band U2, to include its lead singer Bono, produced the film Miss Sarajevo, which featured Bill Carter, uh, who, he was a journalist and it was his handheld camera footage uh, through the besieged city of Sarajevo, he took footage. And you two performed concerts, one of which was beamed by satellite to Sarajevo during the war from Bologna, uh, Italy. And another that produced an album to ven benefit the children of Bosnia called Pavarotti and Friends, Together for the Children of Bosnia, in 1996. Uh, this became a documentary, uh, and bon Bono from U2 produced it. I purchased that album back then, not truly understanding the depths of what was taking place or had taken place in Bosnia, but I wanted to contribute to the cause. Little did I know that in 2018, I would meet my now very close friend, Dina Radelias, who's right here, who lives here in Utica, and who, along with her family, were refugees um, from Donjevakuf in Bosnia. It was Dina who introduced me 
uh, to what it was like to be targeted by nationalist Serbs' genocidal campaign against Bosniaks uh, and her family struggle to survive and the losses they suffered along the way. Her story started me on the journey to continue with what I'm doing today. Uh, after writing about her in my first book, I mailed her a copy, I don't know if you remember this, Dina, of the Pavarotti and Friends CD in a way to let her know that I thought, uh, yes, the world had turned a blind eye, but that we still remember the children um, and that she and her family and millions of others were not alone. So to finish off this part of my presentation, I'm going to play the Miss Sarajevo. It's a, a clip of the documentary. But if you're, especially because of what we've been seeing on the news with Ukraine, if you don't want to look at these images, close your eyes and listen. If you prefer and you're uncomfortable and you prefer to step outside, uh, please do. What I've found in, in meeting so many friends and allies who are, who are in Bosnia at the time is the resilience. So despite what was going on in Sarajevo in this, in this film, um, they still managed to have this Miss Sarajevo con contest and they wanted to, to, to try to do whatever to keep some sense of normalcy because life was anything, anything but normal. So we'll talk a bit about, we'll go to the light topic now. We'll talk a bit about my book and still we rise a novel about the genocide in Bosnia. No, I'm, it's not a light topic by any means, but I'm going to switch to the book, talking about the book. In, uh, in, in December, I did a presentation with an organization called the Greater Lafayette Holocaust Remembrance Committee, and they have an annual conference. This was their 40th annual conference, and I presented uh, a PowerPoint. I didn't present this, the other stuff that you've gotten to see. I've evolved. Um, but there was a man named Mick, there is, a man named Nick Schenkel, who is the, the head of the libraries in West Lafayette, Indiana, which is the home of Purdue University. So I made this presentation in conjunction with Purdue that was part of this, this community organization. And a week before, Nick did a book review. And I thought uh, I would share it because in the book review, he does a reading. And he's a much better reader than me. And I will set, up, set this up for you so you, you know a bit. In, in my book, in, in my book, and again, I mentioned Satko Mujic, who I, I had numerous conversations by Zoom, and he really enlightened me about what happened in the camps. But he was from the city of Kozarats in Priador. And so my protagonist's family, the main characters, are a family, uh, just like any of us have families, husband and father, Elvir, wife and mother, Hira, and um, children, Amir, who's 15, Halima, Halima is 12, and Danis is 9. And the book chronicles their journey from Kozadats, which is invaded by the Bosnian Serbs. They are separated in con to concentration camps. Elvir and Amir, the 15-year-old, and Hira and the two younger uh, kids, Halim and Danis. So Elvir and ha Amir go to Omarska to begin with and Hira and the kids go to Ternopolye. Um, Elvir has a brother, Tariq, who was in Karat term, and he is then transferred to Ternopolye. And what Nick is going to read for you is Danis, the nine-year-old in Ternopolye, and they knew Tariq and Hira and the kids had met up with each other in the yard. They, they, they knew they were together at that point. But Dennis is missing, and they don't know where he is. And it is certainly rumored, and more than rumor, I guess, that children out of the, were taken from the camps never to return. So you can imagine that Hira is quite freaked out, and she comes down from her room in the school. She was, uh, you know, they were, they were sleeping in a room with 40 others, whatever, and she comes down to, to find Tariq and ask him, to uh, help her to see if, you know, she's panicked, to see if they can find Danis. So I will play for you Nick's reading. Tariq saw some movement behind a storage shed in the far corner of the soccer field. 
There were no men there, so it was dangerous for him to go over to the shed to investigate. He hovered as close as he could to the small wooden structure. Crawling out from behind the shed was a boy. It was Donis. As he lifted his head to see the crowd of prisoners, Donis spotted his uncle. He raced over to him, arms outstretched, hugging him like he'd never let go. Donis, what's going on? Are you okay? He said while trying to gently loosen his clinging nephew from him to avoid any unwanted attention. Holding back his tears, the boy blurted out, I couldn't go back into the room. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of this place, tired of being hungry, tired of not being in my home with my family. Poor boy, I know what you're saying. I am missing everything normal, too. I wish we could turn back the clock. I'm so scared every day, the boy said. I worry about my dad and Amir and my mom and sister. Seeing you and what they did to you makes me so mad. I just want to go home, he said as the tears, now unleashed, streamed down his face. This morning I saw something that I can't stop thinking about. I was right next to him when it happened. She was just holding her child right over there. The mom and everyone around her screamed. My mother came running over to see what had happened. She knew that I was talking to a friend from school who was here. I screamed too, Uncle Tarek. He blurted out as Tarek wrapped his nephew up in a protective hug. I'm so sorry you saw that. I'm so sorry. I heard about this too, but I didn't know you were right next to her. It was horrible in Katarim, but I thought they'd be less cruel here. Let me tell you something, Tariq said as he kneeled down to look at his nephew. I've seen some awful things too especially at the other place I was in. None of it made sense to me. I'm still trying to figure out why all this is happening. He looked directly into his nephew's moistened eyes. When your father and I were younger, we saw a man get hit by a truck right in front of us. He was old, and he didn't see the truck coming, I guess. We ran over to help him, but it was too late. I won't describe the scene for you, but your father and I were pretty shaken. It's not like what you saw, of course, but it stayed with me for a long time. The guy didn't deserve to die like that. I even had some bad dreams for a while. I would scream in my sleep and your dad would wake me up. I'd tell him about the dream and he listened. He didn't shut me up or tell me it was going to be all right. He just listened. After some time, I stopped having those dreams. So maybe telling your mom about your fears will help a little. We have seen too much. And you, being so young, should never be seeing any of this. I am so sorry, my boy, so sorry. Okay, I'll try to talk to her, the boy said. I'm sure I'm going to have bad dreams, though I know it. Let me take you to your mom now. She is just so worried about you that she risked coming down to the yard to find you. Come with me. The uncle wiped the boy's tears with the cleanest part he could find on his ragged shirt. When they found his mother, her face released its deep creases, and she put her arm around her son. She told him that they would talk when they returned to the room. Giving the uncle a squeeze on the shoulder and a broad smile, then briefly gazing up into the heavens, mother and child returned to room 16. Okay, there's more to the review, and if and actually, if anybody wants to see anything, whether reviews or I have other podcasts and other things, my website, jordanstevenshire.com, you can find the rest of this, but I just wanted to have a, a sample of, uh, I'm sorry, a sample of uh, reading from the book. So again, take a deep breath. And at this point, I think, I, I don't know how much longer we have. I mean, certainly we can, we can be here as long as you want, but I um, want to really turn it over to you and see what kind of questions you have. And, and, and it can be about anything, either the presentation, the, the film. Um, Sandro has, has some questions. What inspired you to write the novel about the film of Bosnia? Yeah, I am... Um, you know, I mentioned, uh, well, there were actually three things that inspired me to write the book. And it started with the first book, okay, Our Neighbors, Their Voices. And at the time, I was teaching middle school, and I taught in a neighborhood in, in, uh, in the Bay Area that was primarily um, Latinx, kids uh, who came from families, who, or families had come from Mexico and Central America, and they were scared to death that ICE was going to be visiting their home and deporting their parents. And that was the policy, of course, under the previous administration. It was part of it. It was also the Muslim ban for, whoops, for travel. Um, and, and, and it bothered me a great deal. I also realized that my own ancestors, my grandparents came, escaped pogroms, which is where Jews were being persecuted uh, for murder or, or certainly pillaging 
uh, you know, the village is looting and, and others and, and, you know, other things. And they uh, escaped the pogroms from Eastern Europe and they came to uh, the United, came to America. And uh, my wife and Marisa, her sister, is here. Her family emigrated from Italy in 1962 because of poverty. They came here for economic and educational opportunity like all refugees come here for a reason, whether it's war, famine, crime, educational opportunity, oppression, uh, and, and those things. And I decided that I'm, you know, I, I, I've, I've got to write something. I was not a writer then. And I interviewed 14 people from different countries, including Lebanon, uh, Iran, Mexico, Guatemala. My wife is in the book from Italy, uh, Ethiopia, Cyprus, India, other places. And I met a couple of young a couple of young women, Dina being one of them, who were children during the, the war, the genocide in Bosnia. I didn't know much about it. I really didn't. And that's where Dina enlightened me. And it was from that point, so I wrote that book, but it really touched me. And I can't tell, I know that I have lost family in the Holocaust. My parents didn't talk much about it. I only learned very later on. But I know the, I, I, I you know, what the feeling I had, um, not only speaking with Dina, but the feeling I had about this, it just, I, I, I don't know, it just touched my heart. So I decided afterwards um, that I had to write more about it and learn more about it. And I did lots of reading and research and I've met many, many people worldwide uh, and decided to write the novel. Um, uh, to tell more because a lot of what I learned about is the existence of the genocide denial and a lot of what I learned about is that um, There is a crisis right now in 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 Bosnia still and very ethnically divided um, But the truth is all that people want people who survived this and who lost family members The truth is all they want for people to know about and so I wrote I wrote uh, this novel because certainly many people know about the genocide in Srebrenica, but don't know a whole lot about what happened in, in Priador. So that was, um, and I, today, and, I, and again, I, 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 was, I was at breakfast, went to breakfast with a former principal of the school I taught at a couple weeks ago, and she said to me, she said, you know, this is more than just writing for you, isn't it? This is a calling. And I never looked at it that way, but it is, definitely is. Jordan, yeah, Dina. Yeah, yeah. First and foremost, thank you for um, giving people a voice. Thank you for telling the story. Thank you for being a part of my life, most certainly. Um, I'm thankful for all of that. I really appreciate it. I haven't seen your, I, I know a lot about you and your books and, and, and stuff like that, but I have not seen this. So um, I have a question that I have not actually ever asked you in our part, private conversation, but I'm super curious about. Um, so the Balkans are super complicated. Religiously, ethnically, mm -hmm. the very complicated, diverse part of, of the world, just like kind of Ukraine, you can kind of see some of the uh, similar uh, dynamics, if you will. There's several scholars that have said that it's almost expected that every 40 to 50 years we can have most certainly war break out in the Balkans just because of the complexity. Um, and most certainly, I, 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 I'd love to say no, that, you know, let's, right. you know, let's not even think about that. Um, it's very turbulent times in Bosnia currently. Um, we're you know, 25 years after, and we are, I mean, a lot of people don't ask about after the war, it's just during the war, but obviously war leaves a lot of stuff in its, in its you know, in, in its path. What is your opinion? based on your conversations with people, mm. you know, from all different realms of life, and not just Bosnians, um, in terms of, do you foresee mm. um, another brink of war breaking out over there, or like, what, what do you... What do you yeah, I mean, that certainly is the concern. I don't know, I haven't heard the, you know, every 40 to 50 years. Um, I mean, I kind of, look, I was, I'm a little older than a lot of you. I was a social worker. I can't say I was a hippie, but we could ask Bob and Marisa. I don't know that it was, but I know it sounds so simplistic, and I've said this to people. Human beings have not, many human beings have not evolved. It really is about, I know it sounds so simple and maybe silly, it's about loving one another and accepting differences and diversity and not othering. And I, I could 
I would agree with whoever says that, that until we as people kind of evolve, if we can, to another level, um, I, I, I do. I think I agree. There's, there's going to be that, you know, that spark that will set off other wars and mostly really is about fomenting hate. It's about power on the part of parts of people like Milosevic or, or Putin or Orban from Hungary, maybe our former president, but it really is about power. And how do these people maintain power? Power is money, power is wealth, power is all those things. How do they maintain their power? Often, if you look, nationalism is a big part of it. And then I think until we can somehow get beyond that, I, I, I think there is always going to be that risk. And just to add, I agree, and I think the, the pathway to that is this seek of truth. And, and, and the, you know, just the stories being what they are. I mean, like you already very nicely pointed out in your presentation, you wake up, and you know, me being from Donivakov, which is predominantly Bosniak, Muslim currently, but it was literally up until five days before the date the peace agreement was occupied by the Serbian army. I go home to Donivakov and you know, I'm surrounded by people like me who practice the same religion, and, uh, but there's still parts that are a slap in the face, if you will, because every so often a bus will pull up and a group of people, uh, the Serbs, will come and visit their graves, which Mm -hmm. that I'm talking about graves that have been a hundred years ago. Not, yeah. You know, yeah, and cemeteries, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they will come with offensive right. shirts or right. show the, you know, right. and this means <laughs> what it means in our culture. And so it's like a slap in the face, right. you know, a complete disrespect and denial that right anything ever occurred, which doesn't really, it just burns even more bridges, if you will, if yeah. we can't evolve and forgive and, and right. move on. If, if I, I agree, and even, and like you're saying, that's my, my mission is to give voice to truth, but again, it's not just me, there are so many people doing and trying to do what, I, what I'm doing in different ways, um, but I mentioned that the David Pettigrew, uh, you know, I, I showed you his, his comment or his statement and when you have denial, not just in Republika Srpska, but when you have denial in Serbia, and you have denial in Hungary, and you have, you know, I, I, I think recently I read Putin actually said there was a genocide, I'm not sure why, but he, he's pretty much supporting the current government in Republika Srpska because he's, he's meddling, he doesn't want Bosnia to become part of NATO. I mean, that's a, that's a whole other story. But will everyone accept that as the truth? Right? Will they accept your story? Now, one of the things, my next book, and Dina and Jairo is in it, um, I'm, I'm telling stories about what was life like for people during the war, during the genocide, but what was their life like before? And really, we, you know, family celebrations, parties, work, paying, you know, f for food, taxes. I mean, it was just, there's nothing different, right? But because we're all human. But that doesn't seem to work, like I said, for those who seek power, th that, that humanity, th it, it doesn't work for them, that humanity. So I, I you know, I'm, that's the goal, is to, to, to give voice to truth, and we just have to keep doing it though, and that's the thing, can't stop. Any other, are there any other questions or comments? Yeah. Have you had a chance to interview another entity, um, Serb or Croat, to see what their thoughts were during all of that was happening? I have not The ones that regret it. Yeah. You know, I have not. Now, one of the things that was important to me for Satko, I told you, and he's Bosniak and he's from Kozarats and he, he was in camps. And I, at first, was writing and I was demonizing Serbs. And I didn't put anything positive and he said you can't do that and he told me for example and this I, I have an interview but I'll give you an example he said when he was 20 years old and he went to the camp and he was in Kozarats and he was part of a group that was protecting Kozarats with whatever they might have had you know hunting rifles whatever and he said it was his friend who was Serb who gave him the hunting rifle and there are other incidents in in the 
camp themselves where, you know, guards, there was, you know, a guard that, that, that couldn't do the harm that was being done. So I have not interviewed anybody, I haven't. Um, I do know there are activists in Serbia, in Belgrade, that are working uh, for, um, you know, for peace in the region and working to end denial, and absolutely there are. And the only thing I have interviewed for the next book, there's a woman whose mother is, I think she's, no, she's still alive, was Serb and Father Bosniak. They're not particularly religious. They're from Bosanski Novi. And when she, the mother had free reign, she was still a social worker, actually worked in social services, and the father was put in a concentration camp. Um, and, and the woman's name is Sandra. And, you know, she said they, you know, mixed marriages. They had friends, certainly, who were both Serb, you know, Serb, Bosniak, and, and Croat. Um, so I, I really don't want to demonize because there are people who help. But again, you look at Republika Srpska and the people who were there at the time or now, um, I think some are probably afraid to even acknowledge the genocide. Um, maybe that's, we'll work on that project. We can do that. I'd, I'd be curious, but I'm, like I said, my mission, my cause, my calling right now is really giving voice to, to Bosniaks. Anybody else? Yeah. You know, uh, particularly although, uh, particularly those who don't know about what happened, and many don't. I have friends who are educated about all sorts of things, and many don't know what happened. I think it is in enlightening them uh, as as to what what happened. And again, as my presentation said, there are universal lessons. We really need to look at what's going on in the world. We need to look at China. There are Uyghurs that are in prison, a million and a half in, quote, re-education camps, which are concentration camps. We've seen things in the, uh, now in the Tigray region in Ethiopia. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's people being vigilant and aware that these things are going on and what action they might take, whether they write to legislators or just at least share with friends, you know, were you aware that this is happening and now I see something, you know, going on in, you know, whatever country and uh, we can't just live our lives. We, we are, we are brothers and sisters, basically. Part of it and the problem now in Bosnia politically is that on all sides, ethnic, there's such division. And again, it's about power and corrupt. There's a great deal of corruption. It's functional for those in power to keep this division, to keep this hate and fear, you know? And you're, the person you met, he gets it and he doesn't want to deal with it, so he wants to leave. So there are people who get it. That's why the whole political structure needs to be changed in, in Bosnia. And how can we from now on learn from this, what we did, yeah. and move on so this doesn't happen ever again? Right. But not just to us in Bosnia, but right. in general. No. no, you're right, and that's how, that's the, that's, the hope for reconciliation, but again, as long as the power structure is the way it is, that is really not going to happen, um, and you know, the education system, etc. But you're right, and that's, I think, that all Bosniaks and, and Catholic Croats who were targeted want, is just some level of, can you acknowledge that this happened? Can you, is there any sense, can you, is there just a little bit of acknowledgement, but um, but anyway, I know you guys have been really patient, been here a long time, and I really appreciate it. I want to, you know, just end with um, hope. In my book, I, I will tell you, in the cover of the book, um, there's a picture, I don't know, oh, I got to use this thing. Um, you see the flowers in the cover of the book? When the art director first presented this, and you know, I went through a number of iterations, the flowers were wilted, they were, they were folded over. And I looked at it and said, I, I, I want, there has to be some level of hope. And pretty much, at least here in the diaspora, most anyone I've spoken with who went through that, through the, the genocide, still has some level of hope. They're very resilient folks. And I wanted to say that's why the title is And Still We Rise. Because you'll see at the end of the book, um, it's not that everything's healed and fixed, but there is some level of hope. And I think as human beings, we always have to have hope. So I'll end with that. And uh, thank you for being here.